Good morning, and uh, thanks very much, first of all, to Oil & Gas UK for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I actually got a text yesterday during the day from a friend who said, is there some other Tom Reynolds? Because I've noticed there's a Tom Reynolds speaking at the business breakfast. Uh, he couldn't believe that I could actually get out of my bed at this time in the morning. But uh, here I am, I think he owes me a beer now. Anyway, so I'm here to talk about Bridge Energy, ASA. For those of you that are uh, clued up, ASA means we're a listed company in Norway, but we have uh, a significant balanced uh, portfolio in two places, both the UK and Norway, and I'm going to talk about both today. And at the end of the talk, having put it in the context of Bridge Energy, I'll talk about a couple of the challenges that I think we face, both as an industry and as an independent seeking to grow in the North Sea. This basically says things change, so please pay attention. And uh, really, by way of introduction, um, Bridge was created in 2010 in its current form through the combination of a company that many of the people in the room here will be familiar with, which was Silverstone Energy Limited, private equity backed, UK independent with a significant portfolio in the Southern North Sea, and Bridge Energy AS, which was a Norwegian private exploration pure play based in Oslo. Those companies combined in early 2010, we raised some money and we listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange in May 2010. We've currently got a market cap of $100 million and a very supportive institutional investor group, which, as we'll see, is very important as a public company. In terms of the summary of our business strategy and how we're seeking to grow, I think this slide pretty much says it all. Uh, on the left, you can see our production growth chart and uh, underpinned by a solid base of existing production, and that means cash flow. And that's a point I'll come back to again and again as we go through the talk. As a small, medium-sized, independent, cash is your lifeblood, cash is important. Running out of cash is a very, very bad thing, and uh, we seek to resolve most of that through current cash flow. And you can see here on the left, production growth is an analog for cash, and that allows us to do more and to seek to do more in the North Sea. And these are on projects that we own and operate, and we're seeking to move forward over the next few years. On the right-hand side, you can see resource growth. And I'll talk about this in more detail as we go through, but these bars are the unrisked potential of the eight wells we'll drill over the next two years. And to put it into perspective, the first two wells have the potential to add value equivalent to our current market cap. So very significant upside in our drilling program. I'll talk about just... Uh, how we uh, propose to deliver that. Everything we do should fit into one of these bullet points. And they're not rocket science. You know, if you're an oil and gas exploration and production company, you drill for oil, you find it, you develop it, you use that cash flow to drill again and hopefully find more. And uh, the top three effectively summarize that, as you can see here. Uh, confirmed timing of key growth projects. We want to be clear to the market and investors about when and how we're going to get those projects done. We also want to grow prod, uh, production and cash flow through acquisition. So we are active in that market. And we actually made an announcement of a small acquisition last week. And we also want to broaden our exploration program. And that's about showing investors that over the next 24 months, we can drill eight wells that will make a difference to our business. And uh, I'll talk about that in a second. And the last two is what I would describe as supportive objectives improve liquidity and broaden companies' access to capital. Again, cash. Uh, we are looking to list in London, as well as our current listing in Oslo, so that we can present our stock to a wider investor group based out of London and international investors and uh, improve the liquidity and the trading of the stock at the same time. And resource the business is uh, a great big bucket to catch everything else, which is about people. It's about the execution resources that we need to make our business happen. And again, it's about cash. So I'm just going to focus very quickly on the two main elements of our business, production and development first, and then I'll move on to exploration. In production and development, I mentioned coming from the Silverstone portfolio uh, is the, our business in the Southern North Sea. You can see the map on the right uh, shows uh, where we are. It's focused in two main areas, in the Viking area, which is our Victoria gas field, that was brought onto production in 2008. And uh, Victoria Phase 2 development, which, as the name would suggest, pretty unimaginatively, it's Phase 2 of the same thing. Uh, and then we have a series of developments in the Vulcan satellites area, 
Vulcan East and Vulcan Northwest. Now, all of these assets uh, were won through a series of quite ambitious farming wells that we drilled in 2006, 2007. Uh, in an, uh, an agreement with ConocoPhillips and BP. This is their heartland and they own and operate the offtake infrastructure in this area. And all of these targets are what you would refer to as tight rot league and sandstone, so they need to be fracture stimulated. So when we develop these, uh, they look a bit like this. This is the schematic of the Victoria field development. You can see in the bottom right here that we have the existing Victoria well. Uh, as I said, that's a fracture stimulated well to stimulate commercial rates of flow. Um, it was uh, a relatively early example of this type of development at the time in 2008, but since then there's been a number of other developments uh, that uh, have used the fracture stimulation technology to, uh, to produce commercial fields. And uh, this is basically the blueprint of the development plan that we'll use for each of the developments that I referred to on the previous slide. So this is as close to a de-risked cookie cutter as you can get in our business. We use the same kit, same uh, flow line, same fracture stimulation technology to make each of those developments work. And the only real difference is which particular tieback host we go to and how many wells we drill and fracture. The second part of production growth is acquisition. Uh, as I mentioned, we made an announcement last week that we made a small incremental addition uh, through buying OMV's interest in the BOA field. Uh, last year, we bought um, Nexon's interest in the Jewett field. And this slide's an attempt just to illustrate what we're trying to do with these acquisitions. Uh, when you buy producing fields, uh, you can quite often become uh, accused of swapping a dollar for a dollar. What I'm trying to show in this slide here is that uh, we spend a dollar and get three or four dollars. And primarily that's because the use of an appropriate amount of gearing, which supports our equity dollars, the money that we have in our business, and also a significant tax shelter that we have in the UK as a result of previous investments we've made. So walking through the graph left to right, engaging faces to see complete confusion or a wonderment of enlightenment here, uh, but um, price on the left we pay, there's a difference of time between when we uh, agree to buy the asset and when we actually get the asset. And that comes in the form of stock or an interim adjustment. So the net price we pay is the orange and green bar you can see in the middle. That's made up of debt, which uh, uh, our banking partners uh, provide, and we thank them for that. And uh, left us with the net equity that we need to come from our business to put into that deal. Now, because of that tax shelter that we have in the UK, we see the blue bar in life of field cash from that field. Now, it's undiscounted, it's cash. Uh, but that's the, field, that's the cash that the field will deliver to us, taking assumptions on reserves and the, uh, um, the, the oil price uh, throughout the life of the field. If you take back the debt off that, you get the right-hand side column. So the really important bit is we turn the small orange bar in the money that we put into the transaction into the big orange bar over the life of field. And our plan is to do this on a number of other opportunities so that we can put some of our equity to work and multiply it uh, over the next few years to fund future exploration and development commitments. Just very quickly, uh, so what are we looking for in, in those acquisitions? Given that this is about putting money in to get money out, we want to try and de-risk as far as possible uh, the, uh, the nature of the cash flows are coming out of the field. So low maintenance, high margin barrels is what we're looking for. And uh, Jewett, very good example of that. Low OPEX, subsea tie back to the tartan field, very predictable, very stable. Um, and at $100 oil price, net backs around $90 a barrel. It's a great example of uh, what we're looking for and it very much supports the objective I described on the previous slide. Including on Jewett, actually, there are further development upsides. As you can see here, there's a prospect to the east of Jewett, um, which is uh, material, and uh, there's also a viable development, a small uh, discovery to the south, and we're actually currently looking at ways how we can tie those two together in a program moving forward. And finally, BOA, the transaction we announced last week, is very small, 1.5% working interest of the BOA field, which is a trans-median line field. Um, the net reserves to us are half a million barrels, and it's 250 barrels a day. But it's low maintenance, high OPEX, sorry, high margin, low OPEX, low decommissioning exposure, uh, exactly what we're looking for, 
to turn a dollar of our money over the next few years into a few more dollars to fund our wider business. And if we add all those things together, uh, this is a multicolored version of the slide you saw, the, the graph you saw on the first page. So you can see our existing position 2012 with Victoria Phase 1, Dewart and Boa. And you can see the gas developments uh, rolling in with Victoria Phase 2, Vulcan East and Vulcan Northwest. And you can see very significant steps up in production here as we move forward over the next couple of years, both in terms of marshalling the technical resources to make this happen and also the capital to make this happen. So production and development, that delivers the cash flow to fund the next development and exploration. And this is about resource growth, finding barrels in the ground that make our business bigger. And in terms of our 2012-2013 exploration targets, we have nine wells. Uh, five of them are in 2012, and they're shown in orange here. And you can see that they are predominantly in Norway and predominantly in the North Sea in Norway. And that's not an accident. That's close to infrastructure, close to where oil's already been found. So you give yourself the highest possible chance of identifying resources that will be commercial and will move forward into development. Putting that in a histogram form, this again is the, ver the uh, more detailed version of the graph we saw in the, the introduction slide. And you can see 2012-2013 program uh, and the unrisked and risked uh, potential in each one of these wells. Um, looking through the 2012 committed program, these are all dated, rigs committed, joint venture approved. These are going to happen now. Uh, and just to put your eye in and to give you some context, the first two, uh, which is Yaita and PL457, each of those 30 million barrels net to bridge on an unrisked basis, they have the potential to add value to our business that's equivalent to our market cap today. So a very impactful program that we'll be drilling over the next two years. And if we just focus on uh, a couple of those licenses we go through, uh, PL457 is in the Utsira High. All the geologists in the room just got very excited. Um, this is where 500 million barrels have been found in Luno, Apollo, Draupna in the last two or three years and the massive Johann Svedrup, which, depending on whose estimate you believe, is up to 3 billion barrels. So it's a great ad address, very close to where very significant amounts of oil have been found. If we focus on our particular license shown by the orange boundary here on the graph, you can see the multicolor polygons which represent the prospects on our license. Um, if I strip away the Apollo discovery, which we map up onto our license, the Draupna discovery again, which maps onto our license, and tell us which corresponds to the light green here on our license. This is where we'll be drilling our well. And you can see it's uh, aiming to penetrate three different targets, two of which we believe are appraisal targets, being Apollo and Draupna. And if we add up the unrisked potential net to bridge, 19 million barrels in Apollo, 2 million barrels in Draupna, and 9 million barrels in Mukta. So that's 30 million barrels and that adds up to a value impact of 9 to 12 kroner per share. That's our market cap today. There's obviously further potential in the field, and we would plan a second well in 2013 in this location, which tests a glia, a yellow the, and shown in yellow here, it's the tertiary injectite feature, which is 2 million barrels, and that TELUS extension, which is 10, uh, which is shown here. So, depth in program to drill more wells and very significant numbers for a company of our size. Very quickly through the remaining uh, wells we'll drill this year, uh, the next uh, August spud is Yaita. As you can see, it's in a very good address surrounded by uh, existing fields close to the median line uh, in the central North Sea. It's a large four-way dip closure, another 30 million barrel net target for bridge. Very interesting, very exciting. Um, the next one spudding in uh, October is uh, in the North Sea. You can see the regional context here that it lies on trend with Visund and Gulfax in parallel with the Snora and Statfjord trend. So looking for oil where oil has already been found. Um, very interesting target and four stacked reservoir targets in different uh, geological uh, zones. Uh, 18 million barrels, very important, very big target for us. The last 2012 uh, target is Miosa. It's a gas condensate target in mid-Norway. Um, and uh, we've farmed out significantly, so we're effectively carried on the cost of this well. But even having done so, it's still a material target for us with 10 million barrels net to us on an unrisked basis. 
And then lastly, I had to talk about Hercules, which was the big orange bar at the far right-hand side of that chart, which uh, is shown here. It's, uh, it's, it's a large feature that's trapped up against a basement high. The diagonal line you can see across the chart here is the border between the Norwegian and the Danish sector, so it's on the, what the Norwegians would call the Southern North Sea. A uh, very significant uh, target, and the net on risk potential to us is 94 million barrels, and that's one of our 2013 prospects. So that's Bridge, uh, talk through production development, how we look to grow our funding line, and, uh, and then how we look to spend some of that in exploration to grow our resource line. In terms of the challenges that we face, really just to tie it into the theme and uh, thoughts that we're doing today, um, I really try to pin it on three things. Uh, resources is the first one I've chosen here. Um, I think I've been fighting with a number of people in this room over individuals and uh, professionals. Uh, access to people in this market is tough. We've been recruiting for uh, G&G &G and commercial people both in Aberdeen and Oslo. It's a tight market and it's getting tighter. Uh, similarly, market for key project resources, drilling rigs, subsea uh, installation spreads, uh, those are tight and getting tighter. Um, <clears throat> Some of that comes down to as a company of our size, we're looking for one well, not a program of wells, and that means we, uh, we struggle sometimes to get attention. Uh, the next challenge, I think uh, Paul mentioned in his intro introduction, access to capital. I've called it stable capital here, um, uh, particularly because of all the challenges in the macro environment that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, will Europe uh, dissolve or not? Uh, how will the equity market respond? I think the only thing we can do as an independent company is uh, to make sure we raise money when it's available. And what I hope you've heard today is we're trying to resolve that problem internally by growing our cash flow line so we can meet our requirements from cash that we are much more in control of rather than going to the bank of mum and dad every year. And then finally, uh, the last challenge that uh, I've had recent experience of is around financial security requirements. Uh, I think. Uh, it's uh, all too easy to reach for the letter of credit uh, when we're contracting with each other and when we're buying assets from each other. Uh, and I think uh, for me as a small company, I think uh, one thing that's, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to come here and not say it is that letter of credit for me is basically locking up equity in a drawer and it doesn't do anything for me. So it's very inefficient. So increasing security requirements, whether they're justified or not, means that the remaining money in my business needs to work harder to achieve the returns that my investors would like to see. Uh, the more money that you have to put in the drawer, the harder it works. And at some point, that equation breaks. So I think pragmatism around security requirements is required. Other forms of security should be considered. And the last point here, credit rating. Some of the uh, standard agreements we deal in refer back to credit ratings that very few banks actually have anymore. So uh, make sure you don't sign an agreement that requires a double A plus security rating and then find your bank as isn't actually able to furnish that. So briefly in summary, um, what I hope you've heard is that uh, we have uh, all our core activity funded by cash flow. We're seeking to grow that cash flow through developments and production uh, in a pretty aggressive schedule so that we can do more next year and more the year after. And a big part of that program is exploration to find significant resources, predominantly in the Norwegian North Sea for the moment, but we have a growing portfolio in the UK um, for resources that could significantly add uh, to our resource base, and that's what our program becomes in three, four, five years' time. And that last line just means that right now uh, it, we're very competitively priced relative to our peer group. That's all I had to say. Thanks very much.